Hello and welcome everybody uh, to our July webinar series uh, on rescuing Mother Earth. This is webinar two in our webinar series. And today it's about ecosystem restoration examples. So before we get started and allow participants to join, if you could uh, find the chat button on your Zoom screen and go ahead and type in where you're coming from. We really like to know where everybody's uh, coming from around the world to join this webinar. And so uh, usually we have participation from really around the world. Ah, there we go. And the flood has begun. Yeah. Uh, I, can't, <laughs> I, can't, I can't even keep up. <laughs> I've seen countries and states all over the place coming in. <laughs> Portugal, uh, Tunisia, California, Ecuador, Brussels. Ecuador, yeah, wow. Yeah. This is like speed reading, trying to see yep. all these uh, Zealand, coming in. <laughs> UK, great. yeah, Bedford, Texas, Norway. Minnesota. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Your neighborhood there, Elaine. <laughs> yep. All right. Where I grew up. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for putting in where you're coming from. And I think we've got a lot of folks that have joined. So let's go ahead and get started. We've got a full docket of things to cover today. So uh, we've already had webinar one, which was how to accelerate soil and ecosystem restoration with uh, Dr. Adam Cobb and uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham and, and John D. Liu and myself. And it's really worth a watch if you, if you hadn't seen it. So I you know, go ahead and definitely watch the recording of that. Uh, today's webinar two. So this is ecosystem restoration examples. And we're going to have a great set of panelists talking about different examples of eco restoration. Then webinar three is what we're calling the main event. This is going to be saving our soils and ecosystems. And we've got uh, John D. Liu and Saad Guru joining us for, for that uh, webinar. And then uh, we have webinar four, how you can impact your ecosystem careers in ecosystem registration and regenerative ag. Uh, and that will be our last in the July series. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to just some rules of engagement here. Um, everybody will be in muted mode except for the panelists, and that's just make sure that we've got really good audio quality for all the attendees. However, we still want you to be able to communicate, and so there's two ways to do that. Uh, one is to be able to ask questions of the panelists. So we'll have a Q&A section at the end of this webinar, and you'll find at the bottom of your screen a Q&A button. So please go ahead and put your questions that you want to have panelists answer there. But we also like to have everybody else uh, chat with each other. And so you, there's the chat button, which you just you know put your where you're coming from. Uh, you, there's usually a kind of a lively chat happening uh, as the webinar is going on. OK, so uh, let's go through what our topics are for today. So we're going to spend about 10 minutes on the introductions. And then we're going to get into the paradigm shift that leads to survival and sustainability. It's a video from John D. Liu. And then we'll get into ecosystem restoration camps. Um, and this is going to be with Sylvia Quarta, and then we'll do ecosystem restoration camps uh, also from Michelle Baton. And then we'll get into kind of our uh, July promo, and we'll talk about how you can find out uh, more about the education opportunities around ecosystem restoration and soil regeneration. And then we'll spend time doing Q&A, and this will be about a total of two hours for today's webinar. All right, so let's uh, get into our panelists for today. So first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Elaine Ingham. Elaine, take it away. Thank you very much, Brian. Well, I am the founder of the Soil Food Web School and um, have spent, gosh, I was just sitting here calculating how long it's been since I started my PhD, and it's 46 years <laughs> that I've been playing with uh, organisms in aquatic systems, both marine and freshwater. Um, I did my master's degree on the um, microorganisms inside the digestive systems of oysters. And guess what? They've got bi microbiomes too, just like human beings. So uh, everywhere you turn, these organisms in the soil and the atmosphere in the water you drink are extremely important, important to understand. They do very positive things for growing plants, but if you abuse the system, you're going to lose the beneficials and you're going to have the diseases and the problems and you can't grow anything. So you know, both extremes, we know how to put that biology back into your soil so that you can basically grow plants without pesticides, inorganic fertilizers, uh, weeds, problems. Yeah. So that's part of what this, um, what the school is for and getting the information out because, uh, John, Lou, and his cohorts have been doing 
much the same things, but in specific areas. So I'm excited to listen to uh, what is going to be talked about today. Great. Thanks, Elaine. John D. Liu, you want to introduce yourself? Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, it's so wonderful to be here. I just made it. Actually, the traffic in Los Angeles was not good today. But I'm so happy to see you. Well, or speak with you and um, hope we can carry on. And I, uh, I think it's a great moment for restoration. It's happening around the world. The camps I was just on with the, um, with the supervisory board the other day and the camps are now 56 around the world and growing. So they'll be at least 75 by the end of the year, maybe a, as many as 100. That's fantastic. So all the people who are working around the world to restore our heroes, and we're so happy and proud of them. Thank you so much for having me, and we'll we'll see you soon. Thanks, John. And Sylvia Corta. Hello. Yeah, thanks for having me too. I'm pretty excited to be part of this. I am from Italy and I'm in Italy at the moment, but I am campus plan coordinator. So I usually live in the south of Spain uh, near Murcia. It's uh, very hot and dry there, uh, like many other places of the moon, I guess. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to share a bit about everything that's been done since the beginning of this nice venture down there. Great. Thanks, Sylvia. Michelle Botan. Hi. Nice to meet you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And we are in uh, Caçapava, 100 kilometers from Sao Paulo, in a region which was uh, the first region to, to be degraded in Brazil, uh, the Atlantic Forest Biome. And we are going to show you what, what we have been done here uh, to restore this land. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. And then I am Brian Vang. I'll be your host for today. I'm a soil food web consultant. Uh, my company name is Sprouting Soil, and I'm based out of Oregon in USA. All right. So a, a little more housekeeping items to go through. Um, one, I'd just like to announce our new partnership with the uh, Dr. Lane Soil Food Web School and uh, the Ecosystem Restoration Camps. And so we'll talk a little, a little bit more about that later in the webinar today and talk about you know, that partnership and, and some of the things that we're offering in our July promotion. Next is a quick poll. We actually want to know information from you folks. And the poll is basically going to be, which of the following best describes you? Am I a farmer, rancher, or grower looking for a better way? Or am I looking for a new impactful career helping Mother Nature to heal? And so a poll should have popped up for you. And if you could, go ahead and answer our poll. We'll keep it up for probably another minute or two. And uh, it really helps us kind of understand our outreach and who we're trying to target um, with getting this great information. So thank you very much. All right, one last thing with the housekeeping here is um, we really want to have an interactive uh, Q&A session and we really want to hear questions from you folks. So if you have a question that you really like the panelists to be able to answer, go ahead and click that Q&A button down the very bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and then we'll go ahead and choose a number of those questions to review with the panelists. So uh, last uh, session we had, we had a fantastic amount of really, really good questions. I expect we'll have the same in this one as well. Okay, I'm going to hand this over to John. So, uh, John, I know we have a video. Is, is there a little bit of a setup that you want to do before we jump into the video? You just let me know how you want to drive that. Um, well, um, I'd just like to tell you that uh, I was a you know, visiting fellow at the Netherlands Institute of Ecology, which is based in Wageningen. And I was asked to speak at the TEDx at Wageningen, and so this is the this is the TEDx, and I, I was I'm sorry I didn't make a new film to just talk with you uh, today, but I've been in the hospital, so um, I, I could I didn't have time. Well, um, thank you very much for listening, and um, I'm going to stay around as long as I can. I'm actually at the Birdhouse, the first urban ecosystem restoration camp here in Hollywood. So, and um, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, um, I'm going to put my contact information into the uh, into the chat. Thanks so much. Great, great. Yeah. 
Okay, thanks, John. Uh, we're now going to turn to Sylvia. So Sylvia, do you want to go ahead and uh, take it away? Yes, hello. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, John, for hearing this nice talk. I, I would like you to get back to the bigger picture and not just think about the soil in front of my face. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know if I should do a little introduction that was before already, so maybe, or we can go with the, with the presentation. Sure. Yeah, I can move on unless there's anything else you want to tee up here. Yeah, yeah. I, I can just share indeed that I've been at Camp Altiplano as a coordinator since 2019. Um, I studied in environmental sciences in Macheningen as well, and knew about the creation of the camps movement since the beginning, but end up going in different places before I got there. Uh, so I worked with uh, native species and native species reproduction and reforestation in other projects in the south of Spain um, until I ended up in Murcia uh, at Camp Altiplano indeed. So I've been there for a bit more than two years, two years and a half now. Uh, so I've inherited this great project that started already uh, before I came there in 2017. And I can share with you the story of things that happened there and how it's been transformed since its beginnings. Great. Yeah, we can go to the first slide then. Okay. Um, so if you want to move forward, this is gonna be uh, a bit of an introduction about everything that's been done uh, at camp on the land. So we're going to talk about earthworks, we're going to talk about ground cover management, uh, we're going to talk about the agroforestry system that's been established there, and the reforestation efforts. So it's a bit of all the technical details and also about indeed the whole uh, organization around it and how it's been put in place. Can go to the next. So here you see a picture of the farm where Camp Altiplano has been established. Um, this is the farm of La Junquera in the south of Spain. Um, it belongs to the same family since the 1800. And in the picture, you see the youngest son of the family, Alfonso, Chico de Guzman. Um, he's been, this used to be a cereal farm. It's a huge farm of a thousand hectares. It's a very high elevation, more than a thousand meters. Um, and in a very extreme climate, because we are in the south of Spain, but we're very high. So we have very hot and dry summers. We have very cold and frosty winters. We have snow every year. And this used to be a fully cereal farm that turned organic in the 90s. And when Alfonso went back to the farm 10 years ago, more or less, he slowly started introducing um, regenerative practices on the farm and diversifying. And while he was there, uh, the ecosystem restoration camps movement started and they got in touch with him and they decided to create indeed the first venture on this land. So if you want to go to the next one, we can look at the land. So this is a satellite picture of Campo di Plano before everything started. Uh, so it's a five actors plot uh, in this semi-arid plateau. We have, yeah, here it says 150 millimeters average rainfall. It's also, it can get to 400, let's say 300 average. And this used to be a barley field. And if you move forward, we can see what the idea of the design for this area was. So it was decided to start camp in this specific plot um, because of the location. It's at the bottom of a valley. Um, so the idea was that it was possible in this area to actually collect rainwater and harvest the rainwater in the ground. And uh, here you see the first design that was made, which is uh, very close to what is actually happening there now. Um, so you see there's a natural area on the left side with ponds for rain harvesting. And then you have these blue lines that cross the whole land, which are swales, so they're trenches for uh, also rainwater harvesting. And then most of the land is an agroforestry system based on almond trees. Um, so from this first design, it was a group of volunteers that started the whole project in 2017. 
um, uh, different people that were staying there. They had nothing constructed on the land, so there was no space to host anyone. They were staying in the farm village that you could see in the previous picture. Uh, so they were living and working together, funding, uh, trying to find fundings, uh, working in this pretty tough uh, space. Um, so the beginnings were pretty tough, and um, indeed, it's been a, quite a roller coaster since then. If you want to move forward. So this is the first things that were designed, uh, the earthworks. I don't know if you're all familiar with um, the idea of earthworks. That's basically what you do on the land. Um, I see some people don't see the slides. They see me, but not the slides. I don't know if that's for everyone. We'll have uh, other panelists. I'm assuming that uh, you guys can see it. And some of the folks are saying that they can see it. Some folks are saying they're not. All so right. we'll have some technical support. People help those that can't see the slides. Thanks, Sylvia. OK. Um, so the idea of earthworks is in changing the, the shape of the land, basically, of the, of the soil to make advantage of all the slopes you have and use soil as a sponge as much as possible um, so that you actually can collect the water, keep it in your land as long as possible. Because as I said, uh, when you're working in a place where you can only rely on rainfall for a certain part of the year, we mainly have rainfall since October until April or May, it depends on the years. This year, for example, we had a very dry winter. So basically in November, it rained a tiny bit. And then in March, we had rain again. So it was pretty tough. So the idea of earthworks is indeed take advantage of the slopes and create a way to collect as much water as possible. If you want to move forward, we see the bigger catchment. Um, so this is idea gives you an idea of the bigger size of the catchment. So on the left, you see the picture of camp only. And on the right, you see the picture of the whole catchment. So the whole area that potentially can harvest the main water. Of course, there's um, a lot of, it's a patch. Uh, it's patchwork of different landscapes. So you're going to have some areas that are natural areas, some areas farmland. So not all the rainfall will eventually end up at camp, which is where you see the red line in the picture. Uh, but this gives you an idea of the size of it. So you, when you design the earthworks, you cannot only think of your land, but you have to look at the bigger picture. We can move forward. So here I have a picture of a swale. So these are the trenches that are designed on contour uh, to collect the rainwater. Uh, why do you do this apart from collecting rainwater? You can, in a way, you're losing arable land. If you look at it from the point of view of a farmer, you have your um, grain field and all of a sudden you're digging this trench which occupies more or less three meters one and a half meter is a trench and one and a half meter is a little dam after the trench uh, so you can lose quite some land but you're actually gaining in resiliency again so you can because you're harvesting rainwater you're keeping it in the ground then you're going to have uh, crops that are more drought resistant but also you can combine these whales with more species on the land. Uh, so you can, for example, plant aromatics and perennials as it's been done at camp. If you go forward, I think we should see a list of uh, different species that have been planted at Altiplano. Yeah, so rosemary, santolina, lavender. Uh, and these are good for both for biodiversity and for a possible profit if you want to then harvest these and sell them and use them for your own use, whatever you want. Uh, and these are the ones with the shorter, the smallest uh, root system. So they're on, on the inner side of the swale and they can access rainwater more easily. And then on the opposite side of the little dam, you can build, you can plant uh, bigger trees and bushes. And again, if you go forward, I think we're going to see a list of those. Yes, yeah, so junipers, retama. So it's all, again, species that can be found um, in the area. So they're all species that are adapted to the landscape and they can either be good for production or for creating space for wildlife, wildlife corridors. So it's again working with the idea of combining agricultural and natural areas and not 
keeping such strong separation as it's usually been done nowadays in agriculture. We can go to the next slide. The next step has been the construction of ponds. Uh, you can move forward. So we see both pictures. Yeah, so here you have on the left side, the beginning of the pond and on the right side, the pond. This is the biggest one of them. We have five now. Uh, two of them have water throughout the whole year. Um, and you can imagine how big of an impact this has on the surroundings. So what they're doing is that they're in big rainfall events, they're collecting the water. So the whole erosion and runoff that comes from the whole bigger catchment that you can see on the map, um, it can end up in these ponds and stay in the land instead of going further. Uh, they're partially um, infiltrating in the soil, so they're refilling the aquifer. But also because we have really uh, soils that are really rich in clay, we also have a quite a good impermeable layer underneath. Um, so they're also, as I was saying, two of them are staying throughout the whole year. And this creates space for an amazing amount of wildlife that did not have water before. We can move forward. So indeed, this is a picture of one of the ponds in spring. Uh, this pond was completely empty uh, at the beginning of summer last year. And then, uh, yeah, this March, April, when we had quite big rains, it filled up again, which was really nice. So as I was saying, it creates habitat for wildlife. We see tracks of wild boars, uh, birds of all kinds, herons, uh, ducks, and uh, all kinds of uh, dragonflies and Bees can have a place also near to camp. There's a honey, there's a beekeeper that has beehives near to camp so they can actually get to the water. They cannot fly in a radium larger than three kilometers. Um, there's also an increase in amount of richness of plant species, soil stability, water infiltration, nutrient cycling. Everything has a deeper root system. As I was saying, the water is also infiltrating. So there's also a groundwater table um, it's the, the groundwater table is rising, which means that more water is available to all the plants that are planted in the surroundings. So also for the agroforestry system, for the almond trees we have in the area, this is an improvement. And as uh, John was saying, there's changes in temperatures and infiltration, water retention. So the whole system is changing. We can go to the next one. Um, this was another step in the, in the creation of camps. So you see on the left picture, um, there's, you can clearly see what it's called a hard pen. So you see the first, maybe, yeah, it could be maybe 10 centimeters of nice uh, soft soil, which is what usually happens when you have machinery working the land and plowing, turning the first layer. And then right underneath, you see what it's called a hard pen. So this very compacted layer because of the weight of the machinery. Um, and what this means is that roots cannot grow so deep. Um, so you have a whole system which is very shallow, which means it's also much more vulnerable. So what was done was this decompaction, again, with the machinery <laughs> to break what the machinery did. Uh, we use the subsoiler. If you go further, I think you see a better picture of how the machine looks like. Yeah. Uh, so it's basically blades that cut through the soil. So instead of turning the soil like a plow does, they just create uh, pathways for water and uh, air and roots to infiltrate deeper into, ground, into the ground. So you're uh, slowly creating a, yeah, a deeper ground for roots and soil life. We can go to the next. Um, here you see a picture where you, you for of Camp Altiplano from the top. And you clearly see there's two different colors on the, on the ground cover. So if you go forward, we can understand why is that. You can go further. And one more, I think. Yes. So this was the next step. After the whole earth for preparation, so preparing the land to absorb as much water as possible and allowing uh, for the roots to go deeper, uh, then what was important was adding um, organic matter to the land and nutrients. Um, so they 
at the beginning, they decided to add partially compost and partially organic pellets, which is basically dried out compost. So the nutrient, um, in terms of nutrients, it adds the same amount of nutrients, but of course it's different in terms of uh, soil texture and organic matter content. Uh, and you see the difference on the land. Um, also the amount of compost that was added was pretty big, 40 tons. Uh, so more or less 20 tons per hectare, which is much more than what the average farmer does. But I think still, this was in 2018, and you can still see nowadays the input on the land. We can go further. Um, and throughout the years, uh, we have experimented with different types of soil improvements. So at the beginning, it was indeed this big amount of compost and pellets. Uh, and then we've worked also with compost seeds application, irrigation with urine, because we have volunteers staying on the land. So we have compost toilets and we have separation of solids from liquids. So we use the urines as fertilizers. Uh, we have experimented with microorganism solution um, and uh, loads of different things. Grazing also, and we're going to see further actually. Um, so all of this is indeed, this is a map of uh, the first amendments that were added. So you see in green is the areas where the compost was added and in red, more or less, the areas where the pellets were added. So we're also trying to keep track of what we do where, so that basically we can monitor what's happening and understand why it's happening and what we want to do next. We can move forward. And also a bit further. So we see the pictures of these pieces. After all the compost, um, they spread a mix of different species. So the idea, they had 30 different species. Uh, here you see the annual species. Um, it's a combination of different things with the idea of having a ground cover that could break the compaction. So deep tap uh, roots species, for example, the grains. Uh, and also the, the nitrogen fixers that would make the nitrogen available for the other species. And if you go further, we also see the rest of the species that were seeded uh, that are actually meant for uh, allowing for more space for biodiversity. So, and the next slide as well. Yeah, so this is all of the species that were planted. Uh, so the idea was indeed to create a very uh, varied system uh, these were seeded in 2018 as well. And every year, again, we're uh, doing a ground cover monitoring to keep track of what species are in different areas. So they can tell us also a lot about what's happening in the soil. And we, of course, we see a change because they're uh, seeding themselves naturally. So we are using the natural seed bank, which is on the land. Um, and some species are prevailing on others. Uh, so we could decide at some point, for example, to reseed and see what's happening. You can go to the next. Here, it's uh, different types of experiments that have been done. Uh, as I was saying, the amendments were not only uh, with uh, compost, addition of compost and compost seeds and microorganism solutions, but also with animals. Um, at the beginning, a um, holistic grazing was experimented with sheep. Then a couple of years ago, we brought in the cows from the farm of La Junquera. They are an endangered breed, with Siano Levantina. They're very local. And we also experimented with holistic grazing in spring, moving them every three or four days with electric fences. Um, then we experimented with chickens, uh, but we had problems with uh, foxes. So we decided to wait until we actually have a resident dog that can take care of them. So basically the idea is to accelerate this process of uh, decomposition and nutrient cycling with the animals. It's quite complicated though. Uh, you need someone who's capable of managing the animals. It takes much more time. You need to have the animals, <laughs> um, but it's also bringing good results. You can go forward. Yeah, and this is the agroforestry system. Um, so this is, uh, the basic design of what's occupying three of the five actors of chem. Um, if you move forward, we have a, an explanation of what it, each color means. So this is a system based on almond trees because these are this, the trees that are mainly uh, grown in the area. Uh, there's a big 
uh, expansion of uh, almond farming in the area, which is mm, dryland farming. So there's no irrigation mainly, uh, but it's even if it's organic certified in many areas, it's quite conventional in its management. So here the idea was to take what is done in the area and to experiment with it so that it could actually improve also the soil and biodiversity. So the idea here is to have as the core uh, of the system, the almond trees, and then have nitrogen fixing trees and bushes uh, like the black, black, uh, black locust and other native species like Tritama, and then lines of aromatics in between and keep a ground cover in the land. So we haven't been plowing, we haven't been tilling, we haven't been um, yeah, moving the soil since this system was established. Uh, the only thing that we've experimented with is the grazing and hand weeding around the trees. We can go to the next slide. Uh, other smaller experiments is the vegetable garden that we set up every year. So the idea is also that it's a no-till garden. We're irrigating it partially with the water from one of the ponds. Um, and it just gives enough for the volunteers that are there throughout the year, throughout the summer to get some um, produce from the land. And then we have a system of wastewater recycling. So we use the water that uh, I didn't mention that, but there's actually buildings on the land to host volunteers. There's a kitchen, there's a big dorm, and yeah, I said about the compost toilet. So we get the water from the kitchen to irrigate uh, some of the fruit trees on the land. And the idea is that we create a, a small uh, experimental patch with different species. So we could see actually which species work best so that we can also um, expand the agroforestry system and actually add a variety of species. Can go forward. And the last big part of the work. So this, all of this work is happening on these five acres on the land. And then we are actually working in reforestation. Um, so that's the other big chunk of what Camp Altiplano does. Uh, since the beginning, it's been working in the farm of La Junquera with reforestation, both on natural areas and creating biodiversity uh, islands, let's say, in between the fields or on the edges of fields, in the swales inside the fields. And since uh, this last year, we're co collaborating with the European project, which is called Life Terra. And we are receiving 10,000 trees, native species, trees and bushes for reforestation for the next five years. So every year we're planting 10,000 trees with the support of volunteers that are very enthusiastically, thankfully joining us. And the idea is to expand uh, the areas that are, so both scrubland areas, which are natural areas to bring them back to the native forest, which is also present on the land. So we know it exists and we're using it as a reference ecosystem. And then also indeed creating more corridors for biodiversity throughout this land, which is otherwise a big monoculture. So we want to create um, yeah, more diversification. We can go next. And yeah, so this is a bit more about the social side of um, camp. Yeah, hundreds of people have passed through Camp Altiplano since the beginning. And one of the core ideas of this is not only to improve the land, but also to have a, an educational purpose, purpose and inspirational purpose. So throughout the whole year, we have between three and 10 volunteers that are help, helping us with all the work we're doing. Uh, so a big part of the activities is the reforestation, then we have compost making and experimenting with compost maintenance of the trees, we do pruning workshops, weeding of the trees, carpentry is a maintenance work, the work on the vegetable garden uh, seasonally, and the monitoring on the lands so of both soil and plant species and biodiversity. And then we host a few courses throughout the year to also be able to be economically sustainable and not only depend on fundings. So the idea indeed is we experiment, we see what works and whatnot. And throughout this whole big experiment, we also involve everyone who's passing through the land, which plays a huge role. We can go forward. And I think we have, oh yeah. Um, 
yeah, if you go next and we see the difference. So one very big, let's say measurable impact that we've had is the increase in organic matter on the land. So you see on the left side data from 2018. So they were collected just at the beginning of Campo di Plano. And on the right side, you see data from 2020. So overall, we've definitely had an increase in organic matter. It's very tiny, it looks very tiny, uh, but in the conditions in which we are, as I was saying, with this very dry periods of summer where basically all of the organic matter we have created throughout the year can die out. <laughs> um, having this small increase, it's actually very beneficial from, for the land. And I think the next is pictures of before and after. Yeah, so this is the beginning. So you can see it's a whole cereal field with, um, you see the strip where now the ponds are, which was always naturally a uh, water collecting point. So you see, you see it's greener in some part of history. It's also been plowed and it's also been um, worked as agricultural land. Um, because it is at the bottom of this valley. And then if you go forward, we see the next years. So this is already in 2018. You see the ponds already in place. Uh, you see the swales. So you see these big trenches on the land. You see the buildings popping up. And then we have the next picture, I think 2019. And here you see already the trees have been planted because you see the key lines where the trees have been planted. You don't see them because they're pretty tiny. And then next slide, I think it's from this year. Yeah, this is also different season. This is um, greener, of course. Um, but yeah, this is basically the change on the land also, the change from a annual crop to perennials with permanent ground cover and loads of biodiversity around it. And I think the last slide is a satellite image of the whole change from 2014 to 2019. And that's it from my side. I hope Sylvia, this gave you a good <laughs> idea of what's happening there. Fantastic presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much. And there's a lot of questions I've seen popping in about your presentation and a lot of good chat in the chat. So that's fantastic. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and now move to Michelle. Michelle, do you wanna go ahead and take it away? Yes, Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So I have never worked in the fields before. I was a IT, an IT guy working with software as a software developer. And now I can say that, that I'm a soil developer and I'm learning a lot here and I want to share with you how someone with, with no prior experience can become a regenerator. So let's begin. So we are at Desperto Regenerative Culture Center. Next, please. Okay. So we say that the way that we live impacts, impacts the, the planet ecosystems. So in 2017, me and Gabby, we found uh, this place. So we bought this land and we made the move from this, the, the city to the countryside with no prior experience. And since then, we, we are trying to restore this land of five hectares and also inspire people uh, uh, by, by practicing uh, uh, syntropic farming and all uh, regenerative uh, practices and change their minds and inspire them by touching their heart in their hearts too. So next, next, please. Our vision for the next months and years uh, is to create a school. We call it, call it a regenerative culture school because we need to change our culture, uh, which means the way that we live, the way that we perceive our uh, life. So in the next weeks, we should release an internship program. And we also gonna evolve to become a community because we know that's not easy to manage a land of this size, which is not big in terms of for Brazil, but it's very tough. And we need to learn how to, to live in a different way. So we need to create new communities. Uh, so we're gonna evolve to become one. 
So we are creating our own food, food, food forest system. So it's a food system based on forest because we are in a country, in a place that it was all forest. It was all pristine forest when the indigenous people get here. So we need to recover. And it was to be, want to become a private, formally, uh, a formally private reserve because uh, that is, is, is reversible and um, expand our territory in the future. And also we want to support indigenous people. We are talking with, with a few ethnies because uh, those, those people, uh, maybe uh, as John mentioned, to, uh, 10,000 year, 10, years ago, uh, when uh, humans evolved to uh, create the, the, the agriculture, some people, maybe some people said, well, that's not the best way to do agriculture. We need to do something different. And those people that come, came to, to America, North America and South America, they learned how to live in this place and in a sustainable way. And they lived here for 10,000 years, uh, uh, so up to uh, 300 years ago, they, 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 have, they had almost uh, 5 million people living in this place with a food system and living in a sustainable way. So they know how to do it. And now, now at this moment, they're uh, being attacked. So we need to support that. Oh, next, please. So we are in Caçapava. Uh, it's very close to the São Paulo city, which is the big, biggest city in São Paulo, uh, Brazil. And we are in the Atlantic Forest biome. There are six main biomes in Brazil. Uh, the Atlantic Forest and Amazon are rainforests. And between them, you, uh, uh, you have the Cerrado, which is a dry forest. On the top, you have Caatinga, which is a semi-arid zone. And next, please. So we are in the Mata Atlantica, but we are all we are in a transition to, to Cerrado, in a fragment of Cerrado. So the Atlantic Forest now last uh, less than 12% is one quarter as a quarter of the territory of the Amazon, and it, it's where lives 75% of Brazil population. It's one of the most biodiverse ecosystems in the world. You can have uh, four, uh, four, 450 angiosperms per hectare. And it's most uh, most uh, umbrophilus, so plants that this de depends on moisture, and climate change is affecting that moisture. So climate change might call a Mata Atlantica, the, the Atlantic Forest, and it can become a cerrado, which supports a drier environment. Next, please. So uh, our ecolog ecological context, we are close to a uh, Cerrado fragment. So we are in Atlantic forest, but there are some frag remaining fragments. We are, we are close to one. So we consider that we are in transition ecological niche. And our native forests have, have been destroyed more than 100 years ago due to coffee plantations, monoculture. And we are uh, on the north face. So we have a lot of sun exposure and dry winds. And all the water springs dried here in the last 30 years, even waterfalls. And we are surrounded now by eucalyptus, monocultures, and grazing land. And there is a discussion happening uh, with the ecological restoration in NGOs uh, about using uh, hybrid models in the restoration that combines Atlantic forest and Cerrado. Because if you restore just with Atlantic forest now, maybe that won't have a resilience for a, ch a change in uh, a change, change in environment with less uh, uh, less humidity. So next, please. So we have uh, received volunteers, individuals, groups, and also collective efforts. Uh, so that was be before the pandemic. So during the pandemic, we had no volunteers coming for almost two years. And at that time, what's very good to have the uh, to have that contact with the community and create engage, engagement with the community. So now, now we have a, a very good engagement with the local community, but also with people in Sao Paulo. So they know us and they want to come and join us. So we need to improve our structure to receive more volunteers. Next, please. 
So the main activities that we have now uh, for our uh, economic model, sustainability, also restore this land, is in tropical farming courses. We have just uh, planted an agro, uh, a medicinal agroforestry so we to produce some products, uh, medicinal products. We do bioconstruction for our new constructions. We are a reference in regenerative tourism. So uh, we, we even created an online course on regenerative tourism because uh, we are doing that on practice. People come here and they, uh, we, we host them uh, via Airbnb and they can join in our activities. Uh, in a daily basis. So as you can see in the picture, uh, uh, even childs and families, they come and they participate in the, in the, in the, in the gardening and things like that, or by, by construction. And we're gonna begin the eco-pedagogical education. And also, we also have wellness retracts, all related to regenerative cultures. So next, please. So what's our, what is our so social biodiversity restoration? We say that humans are nature. So we need to learn how to become nature again. We need to create a relationship with nature. So social biodiversity is the culture that emerges from our relationship with the, the environment, the biological, community that exists in that environment. So we need to create that biological diversity. So Ayotun Krenak, which is our indigenous leadership, he says that the crisis that we live is the result of the artificial way of living that modern society has created. So what is, what is this artificial way? It's the design of the cities the way that we live in terms of just work all the time and not having time to, to create a real, uh, uh, real relationship with nature, with the community. So we need to design in new environments to, to, so, so people can change their focus in, uh, in, in, the, in being part of this uh, Russian society and uh, be part of the nature again. So next, please. So social biodiversity is not asking of, for brains or governments, governments uh, for green alternatives. It's to leave the change. So we are creating uh, a local system, which is compounded by food system with food and medicine, and also combining natives and non-native species and uh, the item two, uh, by doing that, we, uh, uh, we, we can create a culture and the values that, that will, will emerge from our relationship with uh, when we manage that ecosystem. So once we go inside that forest and we uh, create some kind of disturbance by pruning a tree, by introducing some new species, removing some new, some old, some species, undesired species, we are creating a culture. And that culture is part of the, the, the social biodiversity. And all that way of living will support the emergence of a new civilization where the humans knows how to collaborate with nature because, because they are now part of the ecosystem. They are part of the metabolism. So next please. So we're starting uh, with synthropic farming, uh, allow us to accelerate the natural regeneration with humans as part of the ecosystem metabolism. So it's not separated humans and ecosystems. Humans are part of the metabolism. And this uh, it was created by Ernest Gitch, a Swiss guy. Uh, he lives in Brazil uh, since the 80s. And it biomimics natural processes. And humans, as I said, are part of the metabolism. So uh, we consider that we are uh, not separated. And, but all, all that uh, thought, uh, all that knowledge, is based on indigenous knowledge because as I said in the beginning, 
they knew how to uh, live in this environment in a more sustainable way. way. They did that for a thousand years. So Ernest Goethe took all the, 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 their knowledge, knowledge and structured in a way that's more um, easy for us, for modern mind, for contemporary minds to understand how to restore the, those environments. Uh, so it changed the landscape very quickly and can create a real abundance for humanity because we see that we can have uh, a lot of species for food system, for all uh, resources that we need for live, most of the resources that we need for live. So next, please. So here is our site. It's a five hectares, it's almost a square. And uh, we, we have restored about uh, half an hectare now. So it's not that much because uh, it was in the beginning just me and Gabby doing all manually, no machinery. And the yellow air areas, you have uh, the agroforestry. So the first one in, in, the, in the center, it's, a, it's an agroforestry that I will show to you, yeah. Uh, and the, the, the one on, on the, on the right is an enrichment. So it's an environment that uh, had some uh, natural regeneration. And we introduce uh, a lot more species. We open up the canopy to enter more, more light. And the area on the top is a medicinal agroforestry. So it has more species for uh, medicinal plants. And the water spring, we did some rest restoration in there because the, the water spring is not, is not uh, perennial anymore. So we plant a lot of bananas and we plant a lot of trees. So the bananas will grow in uh, form a canopy and provide shade for the, for the, the trees. And our veggies garden is now uh, below the, the lake. So make it easier to, to, to irrigate. So we don't have a water during the during the, the winter, which is now. So we just uh, dug a water well yesterday, <laughs> and uh, we are very happy because we found a water. So it was a donation uh, from from uh, uh, a supporter. So we can now uh, have bags in the winter. So next, please. So this is a picture uh, of uh, an agroforestry in the first days. So what do we do in, in tropical farming? We mimic, we biomimic the, natu uh, the natural processes. So any tree grows inside a forest, not in a, in a clear, in a, in a, in a clear, uh, in, a, in a clarity, right? They grow below their mother. So they have shade, they have, moisture. So we need to mimic that since the beginning. So we plant uh, several species, a combination of species, three species, bushes, and also veggies all the same time. So if you see the picture, we have some lettuce, we have uh, nagy plants, but we also have a cocoa, uh, which is on the top, almost in the top. And uh, at the bottom, that looks like a wing, it's a native species. It grows very, quick, very, very quickly, almost two meters per year. You're gonna see that. Uh, and so in just uh, in one or two months, all the, the trees are growing in a shaded environment. And the, 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 the faster species, they structure the soil for the trees. So we plant, uh, natives and non-natives. So cocoa is not native from this environment, but we also plant eucalyptus, we also plant uh, leucina, we also plant a lot of species that are considered aggressive. But when we are managing that environment, we see that they are not aggressive. They support us in the regeneration. So uh, by doing that, we, we have the, all the ecological succession from uh, 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 for, for our forest, and we also have the microbiological succession because we are going to uh, feed 
the 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 uh, the soil life. So next, please. So this one, just one year after, you can see the bananas that uh, was planted. You couldn't see the bananas because we plant banana just with the root system, with no uh, uh, the, the, the aerial part. So you can see that the banana is real. And you see the guapuruvu, the, the wings, the, the, the seedling with look like wings. You can see now on the left that has more than two meters uh, one year later. And two years later, uh, the, the forest is coming and it's growing, but we can still have some veggies uh, because there is sunlight in the middle that we can have some veggies. So we have some uh, radish, tomatoes, and uh, other species. Next, please. So is the, this is the, the, the picture of the, the, the cover. So it's a platinum uh, banana. It's, uh, it's harvested two years later. The, after the implementation of the area. And you see the, the Guapuruvu has more than four meters now in 2020. And the Platano is, is a very, uh, it is a species that requires a very fertile soil. We have that Platano, but it was attacked by a beetle and we, we, we lost all the, 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 that type of the banana, but we have other six types of banana. And 2000, uh, uh, 2022, you can see how is, uh, how is now. So you see the Guapuruvu goes of uh, more than eight meters now. So we have almost a closed canopy. We don't plant bags anymore. So we can plant shade, uh, plants for a shade environment like turmeric for our yam or things like that, okay? And we are all the time pruning uh, the, the bananas, when we do the harvesting, we place all the material in the ground. We have a lot of bushes that we uh, prune all the time, like uh, pigeon pea, like uh, uh, titonia, titonia, and also the guapuruvus that you see here, it planted, it's planted in a, in a high density. So in this area, we gonna we have about 30 uh, trees, but it, we're gonna cut, uh, Almost all of them, we will keep just one. All of the, all of them, almost all of them, will become uh, food for the for the, the soil. So next, please. So this is more uh, updated pictures. So as you can see uh, uh, in a better view here on the right, you see the size of the guapuruvu, which is a native species. Uh, next species, but uh, the eucalyptus that we all, we also use grows even faster than uh, guapuruvu, and uh, the eucalyptus has more lignin, so it's better for the soil uh, at some point because it lasts in the soil and provides cover uh, the, the coverage for more time. So uh, underneath the, the 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 canopy, we have in this place cocoa. We have uh, citrus, and I have a, we have a lot of species. So, when we have the uh, the rain the, the rain season, we go and we prune the canopy, open for the sunlight and the, the water to to get in, in the system. So next, please. So this is a video of the area. So what you do next is to adjust the, the stratification of those species. We go inside the forest and we adjust species by species what that species need, needs. Because every species evolves in, a, in, a, in an ecological niche. So how do we create that ecolo ecological niche for that species? By changing the surrounding and pruning, introducing other species and uh, and managing that environment. So one of the species that we use for, uh, for feeding the soil is the eucalyptus. Uh, we use a lot of species, even grasses like Mombasa. So as, as you can see, we have eucalyptus with more than 10 meters 
and then we prune it and it sprout and then we prune it again and then we keep pruning it in feeding the soil so we do that several years so we have a factory of biomass of resources not just using eucalyptus but also using the native pioneers we combining them but as eucalyptus grows very quickly it provides the material uh, before even the, 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 the native pioneers. So this is our vermicompost system that we designed here. So we, we dig some holes, there is a pipe on the underneath so we can harvest the, the liquid part. Uh, let's go to the next and we see. <laughs> How? Uh, so, so this system, so this system uh, it's, it's for ecopedagogical education. So we uh, designed the covers and the covers tells the story of a fertile soil. So from uh, turning compost into, into soil again, and and creating healthy plants and house plants uh, create healthy humans. So next, please. So we are talking about living systems and living systems, systems are ecological units and we need to create those units of organism niches. So next, please. So we are doing that all the time by, by uh, creating the ecosystem and creating our structural coupling with uh, that environment. And as I said, that was something that was already known by the indigenous population. They created these organisms. If you see their, uh, their agriculture, it doesn't look like a monoculture. It looks like a, a, a cell, a living organism. So the Kayapo, for example, they have, they have now 28%, 28 species of potatoes and a lot of of other species, they do the clearing, they design this, their system, they manage the environment, and they also let the environment regenerate by itself. And by doing that, they are part of that environment. That's called uh, structural coupling. They're connected to that environment, yeah, not just using that as a, a, as a, a system to produce things, but to live in that environment. So next, please. So in a similar way, we are doing the same. So we are creating our food and medicine food, uh, first system. So we have the economic services, food, medicines, timber, bamboo, fiber, seeds for bio jewelry. And with the community, we are gonna create the Bienvivir from the Andes people. They had this way of living that is a culture that they respect all the community, all the living community, not just humans, but also all living beings, all the resources, the rocks, the mountains. So by doing that, we uh, can create a new culture, a real regenerative culture that uh, will be, be based on a bioeconomy with bioregionalism, and people will have the skills for self-sufficiency, uh, self self-responsibility, and we need to dance and sing more. We don't. We are not here to work. We are here to live. And so by so by doing that, maybe we can recover the human mission to be an amplifier of life process in this planet. Next, thank you. I think that's all. Thank you, Michelle. That was a wonderful presentation. I'm really fascinated by the project you have going on. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of chat going on in the background as well. So uh, we're going to sure probably have quite a few questions that uh, you'll be able to help participate with. Okay, with that said, uh, before we jump into the Q&A session, uh, we're going to watch a uh, short video on our July promotion and really talk about the partnership between the Soil Food Web School and the Eco Restoration Camps. So let me go ahead and get this started. If you are looking for a way to make a big, positive impact on the environment, the Ecosystem Restoration Bundle could be for you. 
Whether you're a farmer or agricultural professional looking for a way to transition to regenerative ag without harming profits, or someone looking for an impactful new career as a soil food web consultant, lab tech, or compost producer, or if you're someone who is really passionate about ecosystem restoration, this bundle has a lot to offer you. We've put together four really powerful tools that will set you up for success, enabling you to make an impact on the soils and ecosystems in your part of the world. Tool number one, the Soil Food Web Foundation courses. This is where you'll learn all about how soil functions on a biological level. You'll understand what the four key groups of microorganisms are and how they work together with plants, nurturing and protecting them. You'll learn how to make biological compost and liquid soil amendments and how to apply them to soil so that the soil biome can be rapidly restored to health. These are all great skills to have at your disposal if you are working on regenerating farmland or an ecosystem restoration project, as repairing the soil biome will dramatically accelerate the regeneration process so you can start to see the results in the first growing season. Tool number two. The Introduction to Ecosystem Restoration. This is where you'll study ecological principles and ecosystem restoration techniques. This course will prepare you to make a meaningful contribution to any ecosystem restoration camp where people are coming together to restore their landscapes. Please take a look at the Pathways video for more information on this. This is a great tool to have in your box if you are a soil food web consultant working with farmers to support their transition to regenerative agriculture because it will empower you to have a positive effect on the wider ecosystem beyond the soil biome and cropland. You'll be able to have a positive impact on streams and rivers, on woodlands, and on the animals that occupy the local area too. Tool number three, the Certified Lab Tech Program. This is an intensive three-month program designed to help you to master Dr. Lane's microscopy technique. You'll work one-on-one -on -one with a microscopy mentor in eight one-hour sessions. This is such a powerful tool because it enables you to measure the success of various techniques that you might be experimenting with on your own ecosystem restoration project or farm. You will be able to see how the soil biome responds in weeks, way before you start to see above-ground responses to the strategies you are using. And you'll be able to assess the quality of your compost and liquid amendments, so you'll know how impactful they could be before you put in the effort of applying them to the soil. This is kind of like having x-ray vision that enables you to see what's happening beneath the surface of the soil. It's a real superpower. Tool number four, the introduction to permaculture. Permaculture is a regenerative design approach that can be applied to just about anything from water management, growing systems, dwellings, and much more. This is another great tool to have in your box as permaculture principles can add tons of value to any project. This July, with the Ecosystem Restoration Bundle, you can register for the Soil Food Web Foundation courses for just $3,800, saving $1,200, and you'll get these other three powerful tools absolutely free, saving a total of $3,800 off. That's an incredible savings of 50% off the total bundle value, which is $7,600. We're putting these four amazing tools together because we really want to set our students up for success. Whether you're a farmer looking to transition to regenerative ag while having a positive impact on the wider ecosystem, a budding soil food web professional, or someone who wants to dedicate themselves to the cause of ecosystem restoration, these four tools combined will give you a great foundation. Come join the soil revolution today and be a part of the soil solution. Okay, um, so that was our July promotion, and again, if you are looking for just a way talking to make about a um, our uh, collaboration with the Sofa Web School and the Ecosystem Restoration Camp. So please go ahead on the website and, and uh, take a look at it, and definitely get some more information. All right, we're going to go ahead and start in our Q and A session. So I'm going to ask the panelists if you can turn your videos back on and to go ahead and unmute yourself. Although Michelle, I know you have a little bit of feedback, so we'll probably have you mute and unmute when you're actually going to go ahead and uh, and give a chat. Okay, so our first question comes from Lori, and the question is, what does it cost to participate <laughs> on site at one of the ecosystem restoration camps? So John, Sylvia, Michelle, do you want to tackle that question? Well, um, 
I would just say it, it differs in different places and there are different ways that you can, you can join and participate. Um, I would just say go to the ecosystemrestorationcamps.org and then all the all that are on offer will be there. And if you if there's one which is close to you or that you're really interested in, contact them and talk to them and find ways that you can work together. Do you, Sylvia, do you have you have your your programs normally? Yeah, so we usually host volunteers throughout the whole year, and that's a we ask for a contribution of 100 euros a month. Um, and then there are specific courses that we host and then indeed on the website is all the information about the costs of each course. Great. Okay. Uh, Michelle, anything you want to add? No, 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 thanks. All right, great. All right, great. Let's, let's go ahead and move on to our next question. So the next question comes from Thomas and Thomas says, what is the best way to get the world to fall in love with all microscopic life? This is a kind of a deep question. And uh, I definitely think there's a lot that our panelists can participate here. So who wants to tackle this one first? I can do that. All right, Lee. Because of course I have long, long since uh, fallen in love with all those cute little critters in your microscope. And that's probably the best way to really fall in love with them is to get a microscope, borrow a microscope or uh, buy a fairly inexpensive microscope and start looking at what's in your soil, what's in your compost. Uh, we know that we need lots of fungi and bacteria and protozoa in the soil as we get to the uh, forest trees or we wanna grow really healthy grasslands. We wanna move things along um, to the place that the plant you want to grow will grow very well. What does that look like in your soil? So learning how to use that microscope um, and then watching them. They are just, some of them are total clowns some are, you know, very straight and stiff and uh, herding others around. It's a lot of fun to learn what all they do in the soil and whether this is the microorganism you need to grow the plant you want or whether this is not really a good organism for what you want to do. So we take people through those kinds of understandings. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think, you know, just general knowledge, being able to expose people and make it accessible so that people can see that, yeah, there is something around the microbiology in the soil. And I think once people start to know that there's microbiology, you know, and the soil food web is functioning, then their own observations of how their plants grow and so forth, it's just another feedback loop. Uh, being able to see that progression is actually a really, really key thing. John, Sylvia, Michelle, anything you want to add about uh, how do we get people about, interested uh, in microscopic people life? In microscopic life? Yes, I think people need to plant more and harvest their food because that that's a big change we see here when people harvest something in the garden and they and if they planted that they 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 uh, it's it's uh, how do you say that? <laughs> it's very emotional for them. So I think that's open up uh, questioning to understand what's gonna what the, what's going underneath that, what's going wrong. Because in general, here at least people think that a good soil, it's a clean soil. So they need to remove everything and burn, but once they see that the uh, fertile soil, it's uh, covered and uh, rich in organic matter, uh, they, they, they love the, the soil life. Yeah, when you burn off the, biology, the um, organic matter in the soil, you're burning the biology and then what's left for those organisms that didn't get killed by the heat, um, what are they supposed to do for food? And so, of course, you're back at that very early successional stage with the weeds and the um, not very productive grasses. And you've got to rebuild all of that to where you want it to be for the plant you would like to grow. And that's what we try to teach people is um, that kind of understanding. 
What, what I would add to that perhaps is that uh, everything is interrelated. So the, the water cycle, the amazing biodiversity, the height of the canopy, the physics um, of temperature differentials and wind speeds and all these are, are connected. And when you understand that, it's so incredibly fascinating and it, it's also connected to infinity. So when you, when you get to this point, I don't think you can stop. So like if you, if you get to the point where it's so fascinating that you can never stop, then you're in love. You know, that's, that's basically it. Passion. Yeah. Yep. You look forward to looking through the microscope to see who else might be there today. And is it going the direction that you want it to grow or not? Yeah, I think also helping people uh, fine tune their observational skills to really kind of employ their, their senses. You know, when you walk into an environment that has a balanced ecosystem, it sounds different. There are the sounds of insects and birds and things like that that may be missing from those ec ecosystems that are out of balance. The smell is different. Um, the, the sight is different. And, you know, one thing I, I try to teach people is when you walk into an ecosystem, try defocusing your eyes. Um, a lot of times we kind of pinpoint in certain things, but if you kind of defocus and not focus on anything in particular, you'll start to see kind of this general movement of life of birds and insects and other things kind of rustling through the brush. And I think once people really can kind of hone those observational skills, they can have that kind of deeper relationship. So. Uh, one, yeah. uh, yeah. one, one of the things that I, uh, the reason that we did the worm compost at the ground level is because all the the living beings from the ground uh, colonize the worm compost. So it's amazing when we open the cover; it's not it's not just worms anymore. It's it's a whole community. There is beetles and cockroaches, and it's, it's amazing. So it's a uh, people really enjoy to see that environment in such, in a such small place. You know. Yeah, uh, I think that's an amazing tool. Okay, anything else uh, folks want to add before we move on to the next question? Sorry about that. I got my dogs uh, and my phone going off all at one time frame. Okay, uh, <laughs> so, so sorry about that. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next question. And I'll go on mute here in just one second. Uh, this question is from Seamus. What are the crucial similarities and differences between restoration and regenerative agriculture? I would, I would say that the main difference here is that um, with regenerative agriculture, we're trying to get the normal food web back into the soil, um, back to what it was originally, um, depending on exactly where you are on the planet and how much organic matter, how much... Uh, have you gotten things back into um, the, the normal space? And that um, combination of the organisms directing and doing all of this interaction with the um, plants. Um, so, you know, we're looking at um, microorganisms build structure in the soil so we don't have to irrigate anymore. Not necessary. We want those roots to get down to the uh, water. Um, and the only thing that builds structure in your soil are the microorganisms. You want to have the organic matter that has been decomposed and producing foods to get the organisms back that you need for this place. And once they're established, once they're back in that system, in the proper balances, doing the proper cycles from a seasonal point of view, you don't have to do anything more to that land, to make those crops grow, to get the abundance back out of your system. So once we can get those organisms back to where they're, to the levels, the balances that they should be, the only thing you should have to do is put the seeds in. If you're growing an annual plant, put the seeds in come the spring of the year, and then you come back and harvest them. There should be no weeds, there should be no diseases, no pests, no needs for inorganic anything. No pesticides. You don't have to work very hard. Go fishing for the summer. I might add a couple of things. 
to that. Um, what I've noticed is that the, uh, the um, height of the canopy and the percentages and total amounts of, of organic life and the biodiversity are really critically important to the overall system. So the soil fertility is hugely important, but like you need the natural systems as well as agricultural systems. I think the first impacts, well, I think the first impacts were human, on human, from humans were driving large megafauna to extinction, but this, the second and biggest uh, impact that we've had on the earth systems is agriculture. And so we converted natural systems either by cutting forests or by taking grasslands or savannas. And what you see is that we, we reduced, we, we went in the opposite direction. It's exactly um, backwards from evolutionary succession. So instead of always more biodiversity, always more biomass and always more accumulated organic matter, it's always less. And when you have, when you have that situation, the outcome is kind of predetermined unless you understand it. it collapse systems. And when it collapses, it's no longer productive. So the, the interesting thing is that we're looking at productivity often. We should be looking at function. And function is always more, functional systems are always more productive than dysfunctional systems. But the problem is our economic reasoning has said that the value comes from the production and that the actual functional system is zero in the GDP type economy. Well, that's not true. <laughs> you know, that's just a falsehood. We made a big, big, big mistake. And until human civilization addresses this, you can't really get completely a different result. The fact that people are understanding this, we're just going against in, in a lot of the people who are doing restoration, we're saying, well, no, this is ridiculous. We, you know, whatever you say about productivity and buying and selling things and that that's the basis of, of, of the economy, you can't do that and destroy the, the primary systems that bring life to the, to the earth. So this is, this is really uh, a, a theoretical paradigm change in human understanding and consciousness. It is falling in love with the earth again. Thich Nhat Hanh was saying that this was what, what's required. And I think he's right. But we, we can do this if we, if we understand it's all interrelated and that the productivity and the agriculture and the fertility will all be better, but we also need functional hydrological cycles. We need very high canopies. The highest canopies here in California were fourth, 400 feet high and 4,000 years old. And in less than 200 years, 97% of that system practically 95, 95 to 97% has been cut down. This is unbelievable. So if you understand what this means, because 70% of all of those forests are water. They're actually reservoirs in the cells of the, of the biomass and they're all respirating. And the height of the canopy is the place where the solar radiation is interrupted. So, you have a microclimate below the height of the canopy. Well, you're, if you move your canopy from 400 feet down to 10 feet or 20 feet or 30 feet, and you expose any soils to solar radiation, you're, you're raising the temperature 10 to 15 degrees centigrade. It's horrific. You so can't we need, hold to, water. We need, to, we need yeah. to have this holistic understanding of the relationships between all these, and that's symbiosis. And so you, then you're looking at multi-dimensional symbiosis. So it's not, it's not linear at all. So it, it gets more fun. That's intellectually, when you go down this road, it gets really interesting and fun. And it, and it definitely <laughs> makes a difference. That's, that's good points there, John. 
you know, ecosystem restoration and regenerative agriculture, they go hand in hand. I mean, really, it's the same building that function that you were talking about. Uh, Michelle, Sylvia, anything you want to add? Anything you want to add? Yeah, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, regenerative agriculture, in terms of Brazil, we are talking about keeping the, the business as usual, as John is usual to say, because we're just saying that we need uh, improved agricultural systems to plant soil, soya, and to plant uh, corn and all those monoculture in the best way. But that's, that won't solve our problem. The problem that we have now, not now, but for 500 years, is that we have been colonized. So that colonization uh, ignore, ignored the resources that we had here because uh, the resources that we had here is, uh, was, it was a, a, a food system based on forest, not on, 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 clear, on clearance environments. So we need uh, to learn here how to uh, feed ourselves from food forest. And food forest is amazing because it's not a crop that wields in just, not, uh, uh, in just uh, a few days, you know, it, it takes years. So it's very rich in terms of nutrients. And we have a lot of food, uh, uh, food forest. So we, we don't need uh, just to restore, uh, to, to, uh, to do a regenerative agriculture. We need to learn how to feed ourselves from a different uh, environment, from an ecosystem. Uh, so that requires us to, to, to rethink uh, our past and also to learn with the populations that lived in this place for a thousand years thousand of years feeding themselves with cassava, with uh, cocoa, with uh, jussara, which is a, a, a very close a cousin to acai, which is from Amazon. So it's a different way of feeding people and it's a different way of creating resource because we can produce timber, we can produce uh, bamboo, but we can also benefit from all the ecosystemic services water and everything that we need for life. Good point. Uh, Sylvia, anything you want to add before we move on? Yeah, I would just say that regenerative agriculture, it's a tool inside restoration. And at Camp Altiplano, we are doing a lot of regenerative agriculture. But as Michelle is saying, every system is different and every context needs to maybe also look back at what was there before and, and, and native knowledge, native practices. So indeed, restoration, I think it's more of a broader idea and concept and, and, and mission rather than regenerative agriculture, which is a way of getting there. Great point. Okay, uh, let's move on to another question. So uh, this question is from Seb and uh, targeted to John. John. Uh, were you told how much the Lowe's Plateau restoration project costs in total? And I think this speaks to something that I come across quite a bit, which is uh, it's somewhat expensive to, to try to transition from our current agrochemical to doing something that's biological or restoration that, uh, you know, the cheapest way is the agrochemical way. You want to speak to that? Um, well, that was basically disproven in the Lowe's Plateau project because the productivity was so low. And um, they, the World Bank gave the Chinese government a $500 million, so half a billion dollar um, development. It's a, called revolving development loan. So as long as they pay it off, they can use it again and again. And so um, what was very interesting is when they, when they had to transition away from, from using all this land for, um, they were trying to use 100% of the land for agriculture, first of all. And when they used 100% of the land for agriculture, it just did not work. They had very low yields or no yields and they were exposed to massive erosion and mudslides and all that stuff. And the hydrological cycle was disrupted and the, 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 the 
temperatures were, were wildly elevated. So when they started this <laughs> restoration project, they probably took 50, 60, I don't know, maybe even 70% of the land out of production and reforested and did all these terracing and all this stuff. And when they did all that, they reduced the area in cultivation, but they massively increased the productivity. So it's, you know, you can, just the idea that you can massively increase the productivity by reducing the area in cultivation well, that should be a clue there. And then, and then when they increase the productivity by multiples, then they could pay the loan back instantly. And it was like free or, you know, they gave you everything you needed to do this. And, um, and their future was completely different because they were in a cooler, moister, um, and, and it, it not only changed because the scale is so big, the, the pilot project for 300, for 500 million was uh, 35,000 square kilometers. So it's approximately the size of Belgium. So if you're, gonna if you're gonna restore the size of Belgium to functionality, you're gonna get unbelievably big climate. So what we understand now is our climate is changing around the world. The desertification is not just China. It's not just the, you know, these ancient places. It's California now. It's California's burning. So if, if we realize that 95 to 97% of the great coastal forests have been lost, well, that's, that's, a, that's a chance. That's an opportunity. You can restore 95 to 97% of the coastal forests here and you'll get an enormous result because the Pacific Ocean is the biggest water body on the planet. And that water evaporates off the ocean and comes in, in, into the shore. And when it comes in, if it, the exposed soils are, are there, the temperature is so elevated that it creates thermic drafts, which push the moisture into the upper atmosphere. But if there's all of this vegetation, it's absorbed by the vegetation. And then it's circulated below the, the, the canopy in a microclimate. This is the way to have available moisture three to four times the, the rainfall. So once we understand these kinds of things, also the wind speeds are changed and lowered. So you have huge winds coming through. If you have huge winds and the temperature is very high, it just desiccates everything. You're, you're, you're setting yourself back all over the world. I mean, we're dealing with this in the Middle East. We're dealing with this in, in, the, in the ancient places. And so, you know, don't take places which are not now horrible deserts with shifting sand dunes and turn them into shifting sand dunes because it's harder to restore them. And it's still not impossible. But you don't want to, you don't want to go there. You want to, because we're having such incredible impacts and it's terrifying to think about, oh, you know, my grandchildren, future generations of life, we have to get this under control and we can. And I think the, the, we, we can't wait for policies. We can't wait for scientists to, to totally understand this. We have to look at what we do know. So we do know that, that, uh, we can lower surface temperatures by, by increasing biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter. So that's all we need to do right now. And we need to monitor everything so we'll know more in the future. But that's what we need to do right now. Yeah, I think it's scary when we start thinking about feedback loops and how quickly those feedback loops really start to uh, build up and accelerate those changes. Um, so we need to be cognizant of that. And also, I think you, you pointed right out, pricing. That there's a cost if we don't do this. And I think the cost if we don't do it is going to way outweigh any of the cost of actually doing these kind of restoration projects. Anybody else want to add something to the question? Okay, let's take one more question and then we'll go ahead and conclude the webinar. So our last question 
is going to be from Janice and is what do we need to give up in order to create a healthy environment and how do we best communicate that effectively to the masses? Who wants to take this one on? Oh, I would probably say that what we need to get a, give up in order to create a healthy environment is human arrogance. And if we could manage that to you know, get rid of that arrogant attitude that we know best, Mother Nature doesn't know anything. You know, the microorganisms that are on this planet, well, a story I like to tell is when I started my PhD work at Colorado State University and after we decided that I was going to work on a project involving fungi in natural systems, um, my major professor asked me to go around to all of the professors in soils related fields, so scientists, you know, landscape people, yada, yada, all of that, and to ask them if this was a good project to be working on. What did they think about it? And to a man, they all said, you're crazy you're not going to walk out of here with a degree that means anything because all these organisms in the soil, they're just there. They just come back instantaneously. As soon as you, you know, wipe them all out with a heavy wildfire or something or everything burned down to three feet, um, you know, they just come back. They don't do anything special. They do nothing to help your plant so why should we know? Why should we bother with them? And I was just kind of blown away because we have had these organisms on this planet for the last, well, for in the case of fungi, they've been here, they've been doing their jobs and they've been doing it well. And it's not until human beings come along and start destroying them by too much tillage, too much to toxic chemical, um, just massive diverse uh, um, disturbances. It's not until we come along and start doing all that, that everything starts to break down and collapse. So we have to get these organisms back and we got to get rid of that attitude that these, um, this, you know, uh, an ecosystem just springs back into life if we, you know, just, I don't know what you would do without those microorganisms. So um, yeah. Get rid of human arrogance first. That's a great one. Anybody else want to add anything else we have to give up to be able to make this change? I'll give it a, uh, one thing that I would say, which is yeah, say, um, we need to reduce um, our dependence upon the globalized food system. We need to eat more local and eat more seasonal. Um, we need to be able to create those regenerative agricultural systems in the communities that we live and, and feed ourselves in the, that local space. My take. Anybody else want to add something? Yes. Uh, well, I, I was questioning question myself uh, if that life working on computers uh, behind the computers all the time makes sense. And I realized that if I wanted to stop that and just leave something else, I was not free because I wouldn't have food and I wouldn't have shelter. So I decided to learn how to, to grow my food. So that that how the, how it began begins, and I'm here. So uh, I I research about organic uh, farming, and then I, I discovered uh, agroforestry and realized that agroforestry was a more uh, uh, holistic way of creating uh, a food system. I also support us to learn how to be nature again. So I think we don't need to give up all the, the things and technologies uh, that we have so far, but we need this desperately to learn how to be part of the, the nature, to learn how to uh, collaborate with nature. And we just learn that by doing. It's not just studying. Studying is very good. Optimize all your resources in terms of energy, the, the money that you're going to spend, all the mistakes that you're going you're gonna to make, because we did a lot of mistakes here. And the last uh, agroforest that, that we have just implemented here, uh, it's, it's less effort, less money. And so you, you need to study. But 
you need to, to go to the field, you need to practice, and you don't need to, to, to give up all your, uh, uh, all your life to make that move. Just, just, just do it. Good point. John, Sylvie, anything you want to add before we close? Yeah, I was going to say the same, that it shouldn't be seen as giving up something, but actually as a positive step that we do towards something that we actually want. Because looking at always as giving up, it's always looking at it from a negative perspective of, yeah, we have to suffer while we actually want to do this. So we are, yeah, as Michelle was saying, you actually do it. So I think maybe it's giving up fear also of, of failing, of not being able, of not knowing of arrogance of all of this and and just jumping in great thanks john well um i think that we have to share and we have to do everything that we can to have peace so we can see quite a number of trends that are repeated throughout history and uh, those trends do not go well and we are, we're repeating many of the most dangerous trends right now. So we need to come together, take care of everybody who's in need because that could get out of control. If, uh, if the situation gets even more outrageous. So um, I'm recommending creator spaces, central kitchens and cultural stages in all the ecosystem restoration camps and all communities around the world and to take care of everybody, just feed everybody. Nobody in this community should go hungry. Nobody should not have a reasonable thing to do and nobody should be lying in the street, wandering around battling. Let's, let's bring everybody under the tent and feed them and help make sure that they're, they're healthy and, and then uh, together, let's restore the earth, because that's the great work of our time. That's what, that's what we'll be remembered for. We won't be remembered for giga factories, except they'll be trying to deal with the toxic waste and stuff in the future. But if we, if we can save, save the planet, then I think that's what, and save human civilization, that's what we really need to do. Planet's not at risk. Human right. civilization is at risk. <laughs> exactly. Mother Nature will recover from us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we're going to go ahead and conclude today's webinar. But before we do, I just want to go ahead and give a reminder about our upcoming two webinars. We have webinar three, which is Saving Our Soils and Ecosystems with John D. Liu and Sadhguru. And this is going to be on 10 a.m. Pacific time, Thursday, July 21st. And then we have webinar four, How You Can Impact Your Ecosystem Careers in Ecosystem Restoration and Regenerative Ag. And that's going to be at 11 a.m. Pacific time on Thursday, July 28th. So please join us for those. And if you haven't watched webinar one, uh, definitely go out and look at that recording. Um, and before we close, I just like to thank one, all the attendees. Thank you for showing up and, and allowing for your minds to be opened and hearing this information. And hopefully you, you got something from that. Um, I also like to thank all the people behind the scenes who make this webinar work. So we have a, a team of folks that, that help uh, put the webinars together, make sure everybody gets informed and do all the tech support behind the scenes. Uh, so thank you all uh, folks for, for helping keep these things on, on track. And thank you panelists, um, your knowledge and your information that you're willing to share and open minds uh, is absolutely fantastic. So, so thank you all. Okay, so at this point, I think we're gonna go ahead and close the webinar. So thank you everybody. Thank you all. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Don't forget to click that like button, subscribe to our channel, and ring the notification bell to stay updated with all our new videos.